Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tank. My name is Alan. If you were to have told a younger me, say 10 years ago, that we would get not one, but two renditions of Coruscant in live action in two separate Star Wars TV shows, I would have been like, nah, you're lying. You know, Star Wars never does anything with its IP. For those of you who don't know, I love Coruscant. If you were to ask me, Alan, which part of the Star Wars galaxy would you visit if you ended up there, it would definitely be that. I mean, this is a planet-wide city that extends down miles and miles into the depths. I love extreme things. I love extreme examples of what humankind can finally achieve once the aliens are kind of pushed to the sides or below. But a decade ago, the truth is, I was pretty jaded about Star Wars and what it could be. The ambitious Star Wars Underworld project set in the course on Underworld, slated for 400 episodes, had been canned due to higher than expected production costs. And then Star Wars 1313, which promised to once again bring fans to the underlevels of Coruscant, was cancelled as well. It just seemed like there weren't enough credits, pixels, or green screens in the galaxy to bring this amazing city to life in live action. But hey, I guess we'll always have the prequels, right? But then Andor came along. Here was this unexpected story which true purpose was to study the effects the Empire had on the everyman. Guided skillfully by Tony Gilroy, we were treated to a clean and sterile version of Coruscant during the Imperial Era, something we have rarely ever witnessed before. During this time period, Coruscant was like a gift, a precious treasure given to everyone by Palpatine. Those who had value to Palpatine got to live in the core, and if you were really lucky, you got to see the surface of Coruscant, which was reserved only for the Emperor's most loyal subjects. Coruscant was sort of like the Empire's Pyongyang, as in this is where all of the elites lived, played, and had fun, and it was designed as a city to hide the harsh realities in the rural areas of the country, or in this case, in the Outer Rim. And now with the release of the third episode of The Mandalorian, we get to witness Coruscant post-collapse of the Empire, as we follow Dr. Pershing on his rehabilitation journey. And now the New Republic is the government in charge, not the Old Republic, not the Galactic Republic, and not the Empire. Things seem a bit more vibrant, a bit more free. It's almost reminiscent of those scenes of Coruscant in the prequels. That is until you see all of those uniformed New Republic officers walking around. Nice shoes. Thunder blasters. Matches his belt. <laughs> it's a cute getup. I guess the New Republic is trying to get away from the whole fascist looking uniforms, but as evil as the Empire was, one cannot deny that they looked fabulous while oppressing people. But the New Republic uniforms were just the tip of the iceberg. I could sense throughout this entire episode that there was something malicious and just off about the New Republic. Something just did not feel right. But before we get there, a quick word from our sponsor for today's episode, Ownersaver.com. They have two amazing new products to show you guys, starting off with this Black Moon Saber. This is a replica of the infamous Mandalorian Darksaber, symbol of Mandalorian leadership and key to the Mandalorian throne. This is an all-around excellent replica of this uniquely shaped lightsaber. Everything feels perfect from its rugged and heavy metallic hilt to its sword-like blade. Ownersaber.com also has this really cool looking lightsaber scabbard, which uh, can be connected to your belt via a D-ring. This is a great accessory for your collection for when you're cosplaying and you need your lightsaber ready to go, or for just when you're practicing some quick draw attacks. If you order a Padawan or a Master Saber, you can get a scabbard for 50% off. If you purchase a replica saber, you get the scabbard for free. Just add all of the items into your card at checkout and this count will be applied automatically for the scabbard. We also have a promo code MAN20, that's all caps, which will give you 20% off of your entire purchase. Well guys, thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. Now we first see Dr. Pershing in this episode giving a TED talk about how he's sorry about helping the Empire. But despite the shameful work of my past, I now hope to help the New Republic in whatever way I can. Though that work is now behind me and I regret what I did, I assure you that my original intentions were good. I also wonder if any of those Nazi rocket scientists had to make speeches like this when they came to the United States for Operation Paperclip. 
I also wonder if any of them had as easy of a tell as Dr. Pershing here, who always rubs his ear whenever he's nervous or about to lie. It's a side effect of a previous hostage situation in which a blaster bolt brushed the side of his head, perhaps a bit too closely. You see, Dr. Pershing, along with billions of other Imperials who made up the rank and files of the Imperial military, was enrolled into the New Republic Rehabilitation System, or Amnesty Program. It's a part of a wider mindset adopted by the New Republic in the years following the Battle of Endor leading up to the Battle of Jakku. Even though the fighting was ongoing and new Imperial warlords were declaring independence from the Imperial remnants every day, Mon Mothra already had set her sights on what would happen during the post-war period. In her defense, the writing was already on the wall. The Empire's greatest strength, the Imperial Navy, had become its biggest weakness. The logistical tale for a super star destroyer is just stupid. And coming from her background as a former Republic senator who watched a populist demagogue turn the Republic sphere into his own power base, I can't blame Mon Mothma for worrying that the same thing might happen again in her new Republic. Mon Mothma had to walk a very careful line. You had senators like Torwal Moltor who spent all of his time uh, basically attacking her policies and demanding that there's a stronger, bigger federal military. It's exactly what Mon Mothma doesn't want to do. But at the same time, she couldn't just disband the new Republic military. The Imperial Remnant was still a huge threat to the safety of the galaxy. Fearing that future leaders will be a lot less mild-mannered than she is, Mon Mothma sets out to demilitarize the New Republic before the war is even over. I mean, this is how much it means to her. She also spends a lot of time allocating resources for various programs that are designed to rebuild war-torn worlds that were basically left destroyed by the Galactic Civil War. In 5 BBY, with the secession of all major operations after the Empire's complete defeat at Jakku, the Galactic Concordance Treaty would be signed between Mon Motha and Grand Vizier Mas Amida, signaling an end of the war, well, technically speaking. Mon Motha would move quickly to grant general amnesty to Imperial non-combatants and enlisted men. This was another part of Mon Motha's grand plan to kind of de-escalate things and stop the war as soon as possible. The idea here was to give Imperial soldiers another way out that didn't end in a glorious last stand. Mon Motha's dedication to kindness and her belief in every individual's best version of themselves drives the New Republic post-war policies. And at the core of this was the Imperial Amnesty Program, which is what Dr. Pershing is a part of. And right away, we can see a lot of worrying signs. If you've read the Alphabet Squadron novels, which follows an Imperial pilot who defects, you know that all Imperial personnel are subjected to, uh, you know, routine interrogations by psychological droids or interrogation droids. Any feelings of anger or resentment towards the New Republic government or its representatives? Apologies if you didn't hear me. Have you experienced any feelings of anger or resentment? No. These interrogations are a lot more easygoing than the interrogations we see in Alphabet Squadron. There's no mind tricks, no Imperial interrogation droids with all those needles and mind games. If anything, this droid is probably too friendly and it's not really giving Pershing any difficult questions. I don't even understand what the point of this interrogation is. It seems like this amnesty program is really nice. Even this taxi droid seems to understand that. I see you're going to amnesty housing. Congratulations on making it into the program. Droids like this are supposed to be objective and honest about their observations. And this housing complex for the Amnesty program is located in prime real estate on the surface of the planet and near the federal district. This is a big deal because getting any type of housing on Coruscant on the surface was as hard as getting like a penthouse overlooking uh, Central Park. Most normies like Cyril Karn's family were lucky to get a few seconds of sunlight a day. So putting former Imperial prisoners in this area seems very costly and expensive. On top of that, all these reformed individuals are given jobs, training, and new opportunities to start a new life. From a practical sense, this actually makes a lot of sense. The most dangerous thing about a government that when it collapses is its military that suddenly finds itself out of work and direction, but with plenty of weapons and vehicles. By granting a very lenient and comfortable amnesty to Imperial forces, the idea here was to encourage more Imperials to defect. But the lengths to which the New Republic goes to make these individuals feel comfortable just feels fake and off. The whole time I'm kind of waiting for Dr. Pershing to be woken up from some type of fever dream he's having. 
because he's getting boogalit from a mind flare. And it's not just the, you know, paranoid side of my brain firing off. I mean, just look at all these conversations Dr. Pershing is having with the Coruscant elite. Well, I think you deserve the very best, Doctor. After everything you've been through, you're just so brave. I'm such an inspiration. I'm so glad you're working for us now. These are individuals who are supposed to decide the fate of the galaxy through voting, yet they seem to know very little about anything that's going on. You know, I was almost drafted. Imagine me serving. Oh, darling, that was the Empire. Oh, my apologies. Empire, Rebels, New Republic, I can't keep track. That's why I should just keep my mouth shut. We try not to get involved. It's almost as if nothing has changed from Republic to Imperial to New Republic times. All of the players are still doing the same thing that they usually do, and they're unharassed by the changes in government. Surveillance and prosecution, without limit. If you're doing nothing wrong, what is there to fear? I'm fearing your definition of wrong. These are individuals willing to be sick of fence. They want to grovel over whoever they think and grant them more clout. And that's kind of the point, isn't it? Most of us are followers. Most of us are looking at others for guidance at what is cool and what's not. Many of these Coruscant individuals most likely lived a good life under the Empire and now continue to do so under New Republic rule. They adopt whatever political style and policy is in vogue and they simply just go with it. Fascist one day, a Republican the next. Which is why if you take a closer look at the Republic's rehabilitation program, you'll see that it's a complete mess. I mean, yes, the former Imperials that Dr. Pershing meet at Amnesty House look happy and are enjoying their time. They even seem genuinely reformed. But at what cost? I mean, why are you putting former Imperial soldiers there when there are billions, if not trillions, of people living below the surface? There's something very ideological about this amnesty program. It's showy. It's almost like political theater, as in it's designed to create an image, a feeling, but not necessarily get anything done. Then there's a scene with Dr. Pershing and a few of his fellow Imperials at the Amnesty Housing Project, expressing how terrible the Empire was and how amazing the New Republic was in comparison. The scene felt extremely forced and choreographed, but the reality is this entire scene is most likely staged for Dr. Pershing. It's designed to get the doctor comfortable and familiar with these individuals so that he can drop his guard. One of those former Imperials, Aaliyah Kane is actually a spy working with Republic Intelligence who's trying to root out Imperials who haven't actually changed sides. Although it is possible that Aaliyah Kane is a double agent herself and working with the Imperial Remnant. You see, Dr. Pershing made the mistake of wanting to continue his research so that he could use it somehow to aid the Republic. And Elia Kane, the Republic intelligence officer, double agent, I don't know, kind of goads him along to the point where she convinces him to commit a crime and go against his probation, which puts him in a really bad place with the New Republic. Elia Kane had previously been seen getting orders from her Imperial commanders and most likely is here to make sure that Dr. Pershing's research doesn't fall into the wrong hands. But that's just a theory for now. And so what happens to Dr. Pershing when the New Republic figure out that he's not really following his rehabilitation plan. Indoctrination by the Empire is challenging to overcome. Uh, wait, uh, this is a mind flare. I mean, they seem kind of nice, but isn't torture still torture even when they're smiling? This is a 602 mitigator. It's a non-invasive experimental treatment recently approved for rehabilitation. No, it's a mind flare. Is your brain getting cooked by a new Republic machine, which is approved any less dangerous than getting your brain cooked by a machine approved by the Imperials? It's a similar device, but we found at low voltages it can be used to help soothe select traumatic memories. I mean, sure, it's Aaliyah Kane who switches the knob up to 10 later on to give Dr. Pershing a full dosage, but why is he there in the first place? Who authorized an intelligence agent to entrap an Imperial scientist into committing a crime? I mean, what is going on with the New Republic? Where is this justice, stability, and peace that was talked about? This seems pretty chaotic if you ask me. I mean, Dr. Pershing wouldn't have even been in this situation uh, had the New Republic not been so wasteful in how he was dealing with all of this uh, former Imperial equipment they were sitting on. Equipment, I'm archiving, it's all coded to be destroyed. <clears throat> Looks like it, but it's all still perfectly good. It's Imperial technology. Do you guys notice how similar Dr. Pershing's job here is to Cyril Karn's job in the Bureau of Statistics? Do you also notice how the bureaucracy is still there? Damn. 
I just think I could be helpful if I could... It would require authorization from the department. You could submit a C-1023 request, but I've never seen someone from the Amnesty program make one of those. I'd have to check if that's even possible. And just like how the Empire discarded the Galactic Republic's navy when it took over, the New Republic will also be wasting the Imperial Navy and the Rebel Alliance fleet by decommissioning both of them. This and everything else we talked about in this video and everything I know that will happen to the New Republic in the next few years leads me to a very unfortunate conclusion. All that fighting, all that epic struggle to destroy the Empire has brought about very little change. The change is really just at the superficial level. I mean, the culture, the culture has changed, but I'd argue that doesn't matter that much. People say different things now, they dress differently, and their political views and what they're allowed to say have changed as well. People are freer from the tyranny of government, but not necessarily untouched by the tyranny imposed on them by poverty or a lack of security. But the policies that dictate the galaxy have not changed much. The economic system and political system have also not changed much, which leads me to ask this very tough question, was it worth it? All those billions of lives lost during the Galactic Civil War.